Hello, good morning and welcome. If you're joining us on the YouTube channel or if you are here, it is the official last day of going over content. Today is just a review of pretty much everything that we've talked about for the past two and a half weeks now. So we'll be talking about some material from all the way from chapter one through chapter three today. So that is what we are covering today and it'll be very great preparation for your mock midterm tomorrow. Speaking of which, let's talk about that. So I said your mock midterm is tomorrow, Thursday, August, something, something. This is going to be a in-class midterm. What does that mean? That means hopefully everyone can show up tomorrow. Uh, if you've been showing up already, perfect. Show up tomorrow, try and show up before nine. I know, I'm sorry, most people that are like showing up right at nine, 10, how dare I do this to you? Try and show up at nine. Why? Because at nine o'clock sharp, okay, 9 a.m., at nine o'clock sharp, I will go ahead and release the PDF of all the questions, okay? Also at the same time, that timer is going to be, like the, the timer is going to start at nine, okay? I'm trying to give everyone approximately 50 minutes. So you have 50 minutes to take the exam and submit. So at 50 minutes, the window will close and you won't be able to submit your exam after that point, okay? Um, if you have troubles, it's not a big deal. Okay. Like troubles submitting or whatever it is. But for the most part, right, I want to try and make it that 50 minute time frame window. Why? Because uh, if for whatever reason, your, your teacher or your professor, or let's say school is online again this year, right? I know you've probably been working with it, you know, in high school, but especially here at Berkeley, okay, that time frame, that time limit, once that time limit is up and you haven't submitted anything, you just get a zero, right? So this is good practice regardless. Uh, anyways, yeah, start it. We're gonna start right at nine. So that means at 9.50, right at 9.50, um, the, the window will close. And if you haven't submitted it, if, if you're having problems, that's okay. Just email me or we'll talk it out, okay? But hopefully everyone will be able to join on the Zoom call. So go ahead and just join on the Zoom call have your cameras muted and stuff, okay? I might play some calming, relaxing music. No, it won't be the weekend, I'm sorry. Everyone's just like, oh my gosh, is he gonna play the weekend? No, I'm not, okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll be here to answer any questions about the midterm too, uh, if you have any questions while you're taking it, okay? But for the most part, everyone try and show up on the Zoom call because I'll release the file, but I will also have the file like on the actual Zoom screen. So for if whatever reason you're having issues viewing it, on the B courses website, you can view it here. So I'll make that assignment tab tonight. It'll be locked until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. But that is the tentative plan. So if you can, yeah, show up at nine o'clock because we're gonna start right at nine o'clock. If we have to start at 9.05, if there's not enough people, we will, but the I'm gonna just plan on starting right at nine o'clock. So hopefully everyone can show up just a few minutes early. Uh, let's talk about logistics for this mock midterm. I know everyone hates me because I'm giving them a test on a Thursday. Yes, here's the thing though. A, we're gonna go over some review problems today. There's a very good chance these review problems are gonna be very, very similar to the problems that I'm going to give you tomorrow. So if you're paying attention today and you can understand what I'm doing now, there's a really good chance you'll be able to uh, get through tomorrow's test with no problem. It's gonna be a total of 10 questions, okay? Of which five of them are going to be easy. And when I mean easy, I mean like straightforward. It should take you like no more than two minutes per question. All right, two minutes max. What does that mean? Five questions, you have 10 minutes total. I'm telling you, it'll take you like 30 seconds for each problem, okay? So that is like 10 minutes right there. I'm gonna design the first five questions to just be very straightforward, just testing you on your understanding of the concepts we've been going over, right? Simple enough. The Let's say three of the questions, so three of your other questions, those are gonna be about medium level, okay? These medium level questions, these are going to be about uh, the, these are going to be the easier problems that you would see on your midterm in terms of actual math one at Berkeley. Okay. So the five questions, just testing your basic knowledge, the next three questions, those are going to be more of a, like, you know, the, like the, the easier questions on your normal midterm that you'll see. Okay. And I'm going to give you the other two questions. These are going to be pretty standard. Okay. These are going to be standard Berkeley level, uh, questions and most likely I'm gonna be pulling them off of old midterms that have been given at Berkeley in the past, okay? So uh, 
Again, three medium questions in total should take you no more than five minutes a piece. I don't expect it to take that long. Let's call it 15 minutes and two standard, uh, two standard questions, 10 minutes a piece. If that, let's call it 20. Uh, you can see 20, 30, 40, 45 minutes. I'm giving you 45 minutes to take this exam and another five minutes to upload your questions if you start right at nine o'clock. So again, you have, it, this test should take no more than 45 minutes uh, as long as you can understand everything that we go over today and an additional five minutes to take pictures, upload, submit everything. I plan that people should be done relatively soon around like 30, I'm telling you 30 minutes. So if you've been doing your homework assignments and it's a breeze, this will be straightforward, no problem. Um, so hopefully that uh, gives people a little bit of insight. And for the most part, it's going to be on everything that we've covered. So we're gonna go over some review problems today. I've been pulling problems from different sections. So we'll start with those. Another thing I'll talk about, Delta Epsilon proofs. I forget which section that is. There's gonna be no Delta Epsilon proofs. No proofs, no proofs. So again, I didn't give you a homework assignment on proofs. I'm not gonna give you a test question on that. Uh, would I expect your professors to do that? It depends. Most of them are pretty nice. So if they if they didn't explicitly go over something in class, they probably won't make you do it. There's definitely professors that are like, well, it was in the syllabus. And even though I didn't talk about it, you should have learned it in reading your textbook. Some people are like that. Most of them aren't. The good news is, is there is a curve, whether or not that curve helps us Berkeley students much. Um, but the good news is, is the majority of people that see stuff for the first time if you feel alone, don't worry, everyone else feels the exact same way. So the curve is very generous in that sense, as long as you're prepared. So, um, but yeah, no worries, no proofs, nothing like that. Any questions about tomorrow? Logistics, anything like that? Is there really any, any like units that we should be specifically looking at? Sorry, repeat that question one more time. It was hard to hear you. Uh, uh, any units that we, we should specifically look at? Yeah, I'm gonna. So I'm going over today right now. I'm pulling questions from uh, the specific units. Okay. So if I write down a specific section from where I'm pulling these problems from, I should probably go back and review that section a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk about that more in just a second. For the most part, uh, yeah, let me talk about that. I'm gonna go on to the next page here really quick. So we've done sections 1.1 all the way through 3.4. So all the way through 3.4. Okay, so these are the total chapters. We've gone through 1.1 through 3.4. And I think for the most part, we've skipped. Actually, I can, I can tell you this right now. So we've done 1.1 through 1.5. 1.1 through 1.5. So there's five there. For section or for chapter two, we did cha uh, sections 2.1 through 2.8. And for chapter three, we did 3.1 through 3.4. So uh, in total, we did about 15, about 15 chapters. For the most part, they build on each other. I'm not going to give you the simple problems from like the earlier chapter, right? About halfway through. So if you want to study anything, I would say study like the, the second half of all the sections from each chapter because it builds on each other, right? Because um, I'm not going to give you a basic like, oh, what's the limit of, <clears throat> what's the limit as X goes to zero? of one over X, okay? <clears throat> that's like section 2.1 stuff. We know that that answer as X goes to zero, that's infinity, right? So again, um, just like, that's like section 2.1, 2.4 is where we get into some of the more like, you know, me, your like limits and stuff. So that's good. But yeah, if anyone's looking for a specific section breakdown, that's everything we've done. A really, really good review would just be to like go back through your homework assignments or the YouTube videos, right? And just scroll through until you find some of the example problems. And if you're on track with that, then you should be good to go. So that is what we're going to do tomorrow. Today, we're just going to review everything. Uh, today is mostly for, uh, you know, yeah, we're studying for tomorrow, but this is really good to just refresh on everything. So that way, if you're gonna go back and look at any video before the start of school, hopefully it's this one because you don't have, so we're, we're at this point, we're just gonna go over example problems, right? So I know everyone's been uh, asking for the homework solutions. I got the factoring worksheet up. That's like one out of your 10 assignments I've given you. Yeah, I'll get there. Uh, give me until like after Friday. So if you can give me the weekend to get the homework solutions out and grade all of the uh, tests from Thursday, that'd be very much appreciated.
because I am studying like crazy for my final that is 50% of my grade. So if you could all just bear with me and by the like by Sunday, maybe next Monday, max, I will have everything complete, all the grading, everything. So that way you can go back, look at it, you know, even look at the homework solutions and like, and that way you feel totally prepared and you still have like 14 days before class starts. That's my goal. So hopefully no one's too mad at me for that. Sorry in advance, but perfect. Let's go ahead and jump right into review. This will be really good. So today we're just gonna be going over a whole bunch of different example problems. Um, whoops, forgot to write. I wrote down the sections. I didn't write down the numbers, but that's okay. We'll start out here in section 1.1. Oops. If you remember back on day two, we talked about section 1.1. I don't exactly know what number this is. It's one of the problems from section 1.1. <laughs> it looks something like this. F of X is equal to X plus four divided by X squared minus nine. And what is it asking us to do? It's asking us to find the domain. Yes, I know everyone's like, oh, this is easy. Yeah, because we've seen this before, right? Um, find the domain. What is the, do the domain? The domain is simply just all of the x values that the graph can equal, right? That is the domain. Like, what are what are all possible x values that this function can be? So we say that we're looking for the x values. Okay, well, the x values can be just about anything so long as the y values exist on the graph, right? In other words, we don't want any holes, asymptotes, or uh, you know, vertical asymptotes or anything like that that could cause us trouble. How do we find that? We look at the denominator here, okay? We said that for the most part, we don't want the denominator being zero, right? Because that's undefined, right? For these problems, that's undefined. So what do we do? Let's go ahead and figure out what X cannot equal based on the denominator right here. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna work on it separately. We have X squared minus nine, okay? Two ways to do this. One, you could factor it out really quick and go, oh, that's the FOIL method. Two, set it equal to zero, right? Because we don't want this equal to zero. Add nine to the other side. X squared equals nine, all right? Square root both sides. X equals plus or minus the square root of nine, right? Because when you square something, you take the plus or minus of it. Square root of nine is just three. So X is equal to plus or minus three, okay? We set it equal to zero. We said we don't want it to equal zero, right? We don't want it to equal zero. So X cannot equal this. So X cannot equal plus or minus three. So the solution to this problem is simply X is all real numbers except for, so X is equal to all real numbers. Boom, that notation, except for X cannot equal plus or minus three. It's as easy as that. Um, again, I don't care about notation as long as it's understandable, right? Um, this is good enough for me. X can equal all real numbers, but X can equal positive three, X can equal negative three, all right? And you can see if you were to plug in three and negative three, okay, square it, nine minus nine is zero in the denominator. We don't want that. So that is the domain of this function. Any questions? I didn't think so. I just asked that if there were any questions so I could take a sip of coffee. Uh -huh. I have learned, I'm kidding. Um, cool. Let's jump forward into the next problem from section 1.5. So you can see I kind of jumped ahead a little bit. Why? Because 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, that's just building off of each other. And at this point, I don't want to go through the basic review concepts. I just want to hit, why are you, there it is. Um, sorry, my, my pencil was not being a, uh, it was not being cooperative, but anyways, yeah. So 1.5 builds off each other. This question is f of x is equal to, and this is good, um, hint, hint, I'm going to give you something similar like this on your test, so make sure you're paying attention. Someone who like put up their uh, camera or who, who logged on to Zoom and is like falling asleep right now, they're like, what? I'm kidding. Yeah, no, pay attention to this one. f of x is equal to e to the 2x minus 1. 2x minus 1. And what is it asking us for? It is asking us to find the inverse. Yes, those lovely problems. Another good problem to review is uh, number 26 from your homework assignment from section 1.5. I, I posted the solution to that specific problem on the YouTube channel. 
So I believe that's lecture 7.1, maybe, I think, I wanna say so. Maybe, no, it's not from section 1.5, but it is a good problem. So either, either way, go check out the YouTube video. It's I think lecture 7.1. That's a really good problem. I would say expect something similar to this and that one as one of your more intermediate problems tomorrow, hint, hint. I'm really not trying to uh, make this test awful, but I definitely do want to make it somewhat challenging so you're not just like, wow, that was a piece of cake. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and find the inverse of this. <clears throat> Again, we can just rewrite this as y equals e to the 2x minus 1. Now I'm going to flip the x and the y. So this is now x equals e to the 2y minus 1. <clears throat> we have to solve for y. I don't know if you remember me saying this, but Anytime that we have LNs or we have E's or we have anything into the exponential and we're trying to solve for that variable, there's a good chance we're going to have to use some sort of logarithmic uh, operation to get that out of the exponent, right? So here's what I'm going to do first, okay? And I hope everyone's okay with this. X equals E to the 2Y minus 1. We can rewrite this like this. X is equal to E to the 2Y divided by E. Does everyone see how I did that? Does anyone have any questions on how I did that? It should be, it should make sense by now, right? This minus one here, right? If this was just e to the minus one, we can rewrite that as one over e, okay? But we have e to the two y on top and we have an e on the bottom. So this is essentially saying the same thing, e to the two y divided by e, let me get rid of that one here, okay? This is e to the one power, but if we were to bring this up, okay, this is e to the 2y times e to the minus one power, we know that we just combine those terms, so it becomes e to the 2y minus one. Hopefully that makes sense. Anyways, I'm going to keep continuing since there's no questions. Cool. Now we're here. Now we're in a good spot. Remember, I said we can. It, it is uh, okay for us to take the natural log of both sides collectively, right? If I said five equals five, right, everyone remembers this the ln of five, right, is equivalent to the ln of five, right? Yes, so that tells us we are able to um, take the ln of both sides, the natural log of both sides without changing anything about the problem, right? Without, it was, so it still holds true. So I'm gonna take the ln of both sides here. This becomes the ln of x is equal to um, the ln of, e to the 2y divided by e. There's a reason why I wrote it like this. Hopefully everyone can see this now. Um, now that we're here, I'm going to go ahead and erase this step. Okay, so we got to this point right here. We took the L on both sides. Now, what does this equal? Well, let's look at this right side for a moment. Okay, we have a natural log that has a term on the top and a term divided by the bottom. That is one of our log property rules. That tells us that we can rewrite the right side as this. Okay, so ln of x is equal to the ln of e to the 2y minus the ln of e. Okay, because remember, when we subtract them, we can combine them as division, right? I'm going to rewrite this on the next page. Hopefully, everyone has that written down. I will give you like five seconds. And I'm going to go on here to the next page so that way I just have more room to work. Four, three, two, one, and boom, it's gone forever. Just kidding. I can go back to it if people need me to. So I'm going to rewrite this. The ln of x is equal to the ln of e to the 2y. Yes, that is an e, not a z or a weird looking 2, minus the ln of e, just like that. Cool. Um, right away, let's go ahead and just reduce this. Ln of e, those kill each other. Boom, we're left with minus one here, right? It's not zero, it's just one. Okay, so the ln of e, they get rid of each other. Now we have an ln of e to the 2y right here. We have an e to the exponent, right? The ln of whatever it is on the inside to the exponent, we can take that exponent and write it to the outside based of our logarithmic properties, okay? So we can rewrite this as 2y times the ln of what are we left with over just e. Hey, hey, look at that. Okay, ln of x equals this. All right, let's go ahead and get rid of that ln of e. Boom, that goes to one. Now we have ln of x is equal to 2y minus one. Solve for y, we're almost done. Add one to the other side. 
This is ln of x plus one is equal to two y, divide by two and we're done, boom. There it is, final answer. Y is equal to the ln of x plus one all over two. Any questions there? That is from section 1.5. Can you leave it there for a bit? Yeah, 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 I'll leave it there, you're good. Sorry, um, I'll try my best to uh, not just keep erasing the problems before you have a chance to write them down. So if at any point I, uh, you need me to go back so you can finish copying it down, let me know and I'll be more than happy to uh, not erase. Like I, I, I try my best to just go on to a new page and not erase it just in case, so. Yeah, just let me know and I'll give you some extra time. All right, everyone good now. Does anyone need more time or am I good? Wait, so the final answer would just be uh, ln of x plus one divided by two, is that it? Yep, equals y, because we were solving for y, okay, yeah. finding the inverse. Yeah, a few things. When you're finding the inverse, switch the x and y, boom. So these two get reversed, then you solve. In this case, we had to take the natural log of both sides because y was in the exponential. Okay, if there is no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next problem. Now, cool. Sorry, I was looking at my paper. Um, why are you staring off into the, uh, the uh, where, like, where are you, what are you staring at, Zach? I'm not sure. Section 2.2. Oh my gosh, so frustrating. 2.2, there we go. My eraser is always on whenever I like stop writing for whatever reason. So every time I go back to write, it is like, it's so frustrating because I'm like writing with my eraser. So that's why every time that we've been going through lectures and I just keep erasing stuff when I'm trying to add to it, that's why. Because for whatever reason, my iPad from like 2008, <laughs> I'm telling you this iPad is so old, just keeps like glitching out and puts on the eraser. So it's very frustrating, but I've learned by now for the most part. Um, so I just have to tap the pencil every single time. But 2.2, let's go ahead here. We have x squared minus 2x, all divided by x squared minus 4x plus 4. And what are we doing? We are taking the limit. Cool. The limit of what? The limit as x approaches 2 from the left side. Ooh, okay, this is a good problem. First things first, let's see if we can reduce some things, pull some things out so that way it looks a little bit easier for us, okay? Um, one thing to keep in mind, okay, we're not taking the limit at infinity, all right? This is not an infinity limit problem. This is the limit as x approaches two from the left side. So we have to be careful in how we approximate this, all right? Let's go ahead and factor this out real quick. So I'm gonna rewrite it like this, boom. I see on the top, I can pull out an x. Okay, there's an X up there. This now becomes X minus two on top. Cool. Same thing on the bottom. Uh, I'm gonna factor that out. I'm doing it in my head, the reverse FOIL method. Uh, whatever way works best for you to factor out that bottom when you see a polynomial like that, go ahead and do that. But I can tell you right away, this is X minus two times X minus two, right? Quick way to double check, use the FOIL method. Do you get back the original polynomial? The answer is yes, okay? So X minus two over X minus two, what cancels? Boom, one of the x minus twos, okay? So we can rewrite this over here as x divided by x minus two, all right? So we are now taking the limit as x approaches two to the left from uh, of x divided by x minus two. Go ahead and copy that down. I'll give you like five seconds and I'm gonna go on to the next page. Five, five seconds. Cool, all right, I'm moving on. Um, not moving on, I'm just moving forward. So again, this is the limit as X approaches two from the left side, okay, of X over X minus two. All right, how do we approximate this? How do we know what's going on? Okay, well, first things first, we have to, we have to understand what this is going to give us essentially, okay? If we took the limit as X approaches two, it's as simple as this. Let's say we just plugged in two, right? We now get two divided by two minus two, which is zero. Two over zero, that gives us in 
infinity, okay? So we're dealing with an infinite limit here. So we know our answer is either going to be positive infinity or negative infinity. You're just like, well, Zach, it's positive infinity, right? Because you just plugged in two. Wrong. Why, am I, why is that wrong? Because we are approaching two from the left side. What does that mean? That means we have to pick a number that is uh, like infinitely close to two on the left side. So if we draw a number line here, okay, two, this is positive values like 2.00001. That's on the right side. We want to know what's on the left side. So we're going to plug in a value that's like 1.99999, okay? Super, super close to two coming in from the left side. Awesome. All right, so I just picked a number. I'm going to put in 1.99999, all right? Let's go ahead and evaluate that. So two from the left side, I'm going to pick a number that's super, super close to two on the left side. 1.999, plug it in. What do I get? I get 1.99999 here on the top. What do I get on the bottom? I get 1.999 minus two on the bottom. What does that mean? That means this is gonna give us 1.999 here on the top. Cool, we're not worried about that. What is the bottom value? Um, sorry, I'll plug in an extra nine here. So everyone's just like, wait, you didn't do it. I'm just showing this as an example, right? So. 1.99999 minus two, that's gonna give us a very, very, very small negative number. Does everybody see that? Hopefully everyone does. In other words, that's gonna be like negative 0 0.0001. I'm gonna go with that, okay? That's giving us a negative number. It's giving us essentially almost negative zero. What does that tell us? That tells us that we are actually approaching negative infinity, okay? So coming from two on the left side, our answer is negative infinity. Why? Because this value right here is a very, very small number, right? We said that as it gets closer and closer and closer to zero or closer and closer to two, okay? That, that the, 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 denom the denominator is getting like super, super close to zero. So yes, it's infinity, but what is it? It's negative infinity because we're technically approaching uh, coming from that negative value right there, okay? So the answer to this problem is negative infinity. Any questions on how I got that? I have one question in the chat. Um, if we have a limit as X goes to infinity, uh, would we plug in infinity? Yeah, exactly. Um, in this case, right, the limit is just X as X approaches two from the left side, right? So I just did what the problem was asking. Um, let's go ahead and do this same problem, right? Let's see what would happen if we plugged in infinity now, okay? So uh, let's look back at our original problem. The original problem said this, okay? X squared minus two X times X squared minus four or divided by X squared minus four X plus four as the limit uh, X approaches two from the left, All right? Well, uh, before I move on, was there a question? I heard someone, someone's mic. No question, okay. All right, someone's mic is just on, whoever it is, but that's okay. Maybe it's you, I don't know who it is, um, no worries. So this was our original problem. Let's go ahead and switch things up just so we can see how we would tackle it if it was a limit as X approaches a different value, okay? So instead of X approaching two from the left side, it is now as X approaches infinity. Boom, a whole different problem. Let's go ahead and erase this. Why? Because it is a new problem. Awesome, still gonna give us the same exact process for the most part. Okay, now, right off the bat, I know some people are saying, some people are thinking, oh, that's just one, cool. I know that it's just one, I want us to prove that it's one. How are we gonna do that? Using our uh, skills and knowledge base that we learned from the factoring worksheet. Oh yeah, everyone's just like, I hate you, I know. But I at least gave you the solutions to the final, uh, or I gave you the solutions to the factoring worksheet. So I tried to make that as clear and methodical as uh, possible. Hopefully uh, it makes sense. But yeah, for the basis of this problem, now we now if we were to plug in infinity and all these stuff, okay, we would get infinity squared minus two times infinity all over infinity squared minus four times infinity. It's a mess, all right? It's a complete mess. And we don't really know how to evaluate that. Why? Because we're dealing with infinity. So how do we turn this into something that we do know how to evaluate? Great question, Zach. Let me answer myself. Um, here's what we do, okay? We want to pull out the greatest common factor. In this case, the greatest common factor is X squared in the top and bottom. How am I going to do this? All right. Going to pull out an X squared from the top, just like this. We are left with one here, minus, again, 
This is two over X, okay? I pulled out an X squared. How do you double check to know that you pulled it out correctly? Multiply this back in, okay? So right now we're just dealing with the top, okay? So we're just looking at the top here. So I pulled out an X squared from the top, okay? If I multiply this X squared back in, boom, I get X squared minus, okay? Two times X squared divided by X. If I put that X squared here, does everyone see how one of the X's cancel and I'm just left with two X on the top, right? So it would cancel, boom. And I would just be left with, I would just be left with two X on the top, okay? So that's how you know that you factored it out correctly. Boom, over X. Now, same thing on the bottom here, okay? So now I'm gonna divide it like that. Let's go ahead and factor out an X squared from the bottom part now, okay? This is now X squared times, okay, we have a one minus four divided by X, okay, same thing, plus four all over X squared, like that. Does everyone see that? Okay, same thing. How do you know that you factored it out correctly? Multiply it back in really quick. If I multiply an X squared here, I get X squared. Is that what I have in the original? Yes, it is, okay. Now the X squared gets multiplied by the four divided by X, the x squared divided by x, one of those cancel, I'm left with minus 4x. Okay, perfect, that checks out. All right, now I have plus four, okay? Multiply the x squared back in. Okay, x squared divided by x squared is just one. I'm left over with four. Is that what I have? Perfect, I know that I factored this out correctly. Now what can I do? I can cancel these x squareds out, okay? x squared divided by x squared, boom, those cancel. I'm gonna erase them now, all right? Now we're left with this. We are left with the limit as x approaches infinity. As x approaches infinity. Can we plug in infinity now? Yes, we can. Why? Because all of the x's are in the denominators. We know exactly what to do in this situation. All right. When x, now let's go ahead and just plug it in. All right. I'll just plug it in for everybody. Okay. Infinity, 1 minus 4 over infinity. Okay. Infinity squared, that's still infinity. Okay because in, we can never reach infinity. Infinity squared is just infinity. So I'm gonna write this as infinity, okay? You could write it infinity squared if you're plugging it in. Just know infinity squared technically by definition is just infinity, okay? So your professors might have a little bit of a, uh, uh, they, they might, it, it depends, okay? It really just depends because if they see infinity and infinity squared, they might mark you off points or they might not depending on how they want to grade you. I don't really care. As long as you know that infinity squared is still infinity, that's all I care about. Okay, can we evaluate this? Yes, we can. Let's see what let's see what happens here, okay? Two divided by infinity. What is anything divided by infinity? Someone tell me. Zero. Perfect. I also asked that question so I could take another sip of coffee. Look at me. <laughs> that's right, it's zero. Same thing on the bottom, right? This goes to zero, this goes to zero. Perfect, what are we left over with? Um, let's go ahead and erase all these terms now. Boom, 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 boom. They all go to zero, minus zero, minus zero. What do we have left with on the top here? One divided by one. Our answer is simply one. Cool. Final answer, as X approaches infinity, is just one. Again, your teachers and your professors uh, back in the day, might have taught you, okay, if they have the same exponents, okay, you just take the coefficients in the front, okay? This is technically one times x squared, and this is one times x squared. Cool. We knew right away that the limit was one. I wanted to prove it to you. Now, on your test tomorrow, there's a very good chance that you will get a limit problem that looks very similar to this in some way, shape, or form. Hint, hint. And I might ask you, what is the limit as x approaches either positive or negative infinity, right? And I will say, hey, I will give you 50% credit if you can just tell me the right answer, okay? You could literally just say, that is one. Cool, five out of 10 points for that problem. You did it in 10 seconds. If you want full credit on that problem, or maybe I'll make it extra credit, okay? So maybe, maybe, maybe uh, this will be 100%, and maybe this will be like an extra plus two bonus, bonus points, all right? 100%, I'll tell you, uh, prove to me, right? Prove that the limit is one. Okay, so everyone keep a lookout for that. If you just want to like, you know, get full credit and be like, okay, the answer is one. Cool. If you want to prove it to me, like you're probably going to be expected to do on your actual midterm. Yes, then you're just going to have to do that proof. Factor out a greatest common factor. Go ahead and plug in infinity. See what you get. Awesome. Any questions there? No questions. Cool. 
Well, that was from section 2.6. So that one problem limits from the left, limits from the right, that's 2.2. When we took the limit as X approaches infinity, cool, that's section 2.6. Um, we did 2.7, 2.8, derivative and rate of change. Cool, let's talk about this really quickly. Let's talk about the precise definition of a limit or of a derivative. Everyone okay if I move on here? Perfect. Precise definition of a derivative. Let's write down the formula and I will give you one quick example on how I want you to use that. It is uh, the f prime, so f prime of x, f prime of x. So let's say we have a function f of x, okay? Then we said the derivative, right? So which is the slope of the tangent line, which is the same thing as saying the derivative f prime of x, okay? That is equal to um, f of x, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And that is the limit. That is the limit as x approaches, or sorry, no, as h approaches zero. All right. This is the precise definition of a derivative precise. Definition of derivative. Sorry. I think I think uh, on one of the assignments you put resize, and I was like trying to search up like what is resize, man? What what, did, what do you mean is that word, right? Yeah. That was like sorry about that. Precise, not resize. You're like, what on earth is resize? You're like Google, <laughs> your Google search. Yeah, like, what is the word, man? I don't even know. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, hopefully that didn't cause too much confusion. Um, yeah, sometimes I just miss a letter. It happens to the best of us. Again, I've said it before and I'm okay to say it again. I do not like English. English is not my favorite major. If I had the choice between writing books or solving calculus problems, I would much rather solve calculus problems than write essays. Um, sorry. Oh my gosh, you know what? Everyone's just like precise. Um, hey, if, I guess it's a little late now, don't ever like hesitate to read it. Here's the, here's the other thing too. Good, let's pause, let's take a quick break here really quick before I talk about it some more. If for whatever reason, your professor or something just doesn't make sense, ask them, okay? Shoot them a quick email, shoot your GSI a quick email. Hey, um, what does this mean? I have no idea, didn't see it anywhere. Nine times out of 10, they'll go, oh, silly me, that was a mistake. Let me go ahead and fix that. And they'll send out an email to everyone else. Okay. Um, the class, my summer school class that I'm taking right now, they, they released a practice final for us to study. And that was like last week. They didn't release the solutions to it. Right. And normally they do. So I just emailed the professor. I was like, Hey, can I get the solutions? So I know if I did this right or not. So that way I can study for the final. And he responds to me on the weekend. He goes, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I thought I sent it out. Let me go ahead and send it out now. And so he sent it out to everybody, right? Sometimes if you don't ask, <laughs> there's a good chance that they'll just think that everything's good. So yeah, feel free. I know it's a little late now with me, but it's a good learning experience for just like later on, feel free to um, like reach out to your professors, your GSIs, if there's a mistake, or even if you know something doesn't make sense to you, there's a good chance they can help clarify it. Uh, <laughs> I got another question. Do summer classes end right when school starts? No. So my summer, my summer class ends this Friday, the 13th. Oh. <laughs> no way. Friday, the 13th. Oh my gosh. I'm cursed. I'm going to, oh, this is horrible. Uh, of course it would be Friday the 13th, right? That's funny. Um, oh, well, no. Yeah. My class ends this Friday, the 13th. And what is it? Uh, school the our actual classes don't start until the 25th, right? First day of actual school starts the 25th. The school session starts a week earlier, but actual classes were not going in, I think, until like the 23rd or the 25th, something like that. So I still have like a good almost 10, 12 days before school starts. And my summer school class didn't start till like late June. So you still get a lot of summer. So that's nice. Um, anyways, all right, nice break there. Uh, again, sorry, I didn't mean precise, I meant precise. So I, uh, <laughs> We'll try my best from now on to make sure that everything is cleared up to go. But yes, 
This is the precise definition of a derivative, okay? This, this formula right here, if you haven't had this written down, go ahead and write it down. Why? Because there's a very good chance, hint, hint, I'm going to ask you tomorrow to take the derivative of some sort of function using the precise definition of a derivative, okay? Yes, can you solve it for, uh, <laughs> if I said x squared, okay? If I wanted you to find the derivative of x squared using the precise definition of derivative, if you just write 2x, okay, I'll make sure it's clear. If you just write 2x, yes, you found the derivative. Did you use the precise definition? No, you use the simple derivative rule. Okay, I'll give you 50% credit. So again, if you're just like, I don't wanna do this and you want 50% credit, go ahead and write it down. I'll make sure it's labeled clear and obvious, okay? If you want 100% credit, just go ahead and use the precise definition of derivative. Why? Because you're gonna have to do that for at least one of your problems, I know for a fact, on your Math 1A midterm slash exam. So I just want you to get good practice with it. Okay, let's go ahead and, ooh. I just want to do an easy problem, that's not bad. Let's do this, okay, x squared plus two x. Okay, let's use the precise definition to find the derivative of x squared plus two x, okay? Let's go for it, f of x equals x squared plus two x. All right, so what is this formula telling us? That means everywhere we have an x, we plug in x plus h. Now, we subtract the original function, that's all that's telling us, divide it by h, take the limit as h approaches zero. Boom, done, let's go for it. I'm gonna go and write it here on the next page. f of x is equal to two, uh, x squared plus two x. Did I say minus or plus? I said plus, cool. Um, again, we already know what the derivative of this looks like, okay? f prime of x should equal, f prime of x should equal 2x plus 2, all right? 2x plus 2. That should be our final answer, 2x plus 2, all right? So we already know that's what we should do. Now, if we don't get that answer, that means we messed up somewhere in our algebra, okay? For the most part, though, let's go ahead and see if we can work through it. So again, this is x plus h, x plus h squared minus f of x, which is simply just x squared plus 2x. Oops. all divided by h, boom. And it's the limit as h approaches zero. I'm gonna write it on this side. Cool, let's go ahead and factor out that top. Um, x plus h squared, I believe that gives us something like um, x squared plus hx plus hx, so plus two hx plus h squared, okay? I just did mental math in my head. That That's what it looks like. Uh, minus the top now. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug this expression back into our top, okay, because I'm working with limited space, boom. So that foils out to x squared plus two hx plus h squared. Awesome, I'm gonna rewrite it. So again, this is x squared plus two hx. x. Yeah, question, go for it. Yeah, do, do you only do um, like the x squared and not Plug in like two x, right? What? Um, I don't know if I understand your question. Are you asking about right um, here? Like, like you, you know how when in the, I guess in the precise definition of a derivative, you have to like plug in f of x for every word. How do I say? It? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Thank you for catching that. Yeah. Um. Good. Good question. Sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit, and I was because I was realizing it as I was like solving the problem in my head. I was like, hold on, I missed a step. Yes. Okay. This is the squared part, okay? So that is x squared, thank you for that. This now is plus two, or plus two x. In this case, we said x is equal to, um, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, this is times now two times x plus h. All right, hopefully everyone sees what I just did there. All right, so all I did, thank you so much for catching that. Let me go ahead and erase this, okay. We plugged in, okay? We, we said we want f of x plus h up here, right? Okay, so we plug in x plus h for every point in our function that we have an x, okay? So this first part right here, that's what I solved for. That is x squared. Sorry, this is not squared, okay? We squared it already. We did the FOIL method, all right? So this, what's, what's in the parentheses of this yellow bracket right here, that is the x squared for when we plugged in x plus h, okay? 
Now we have to take care of this or plus two X, all right? So this plus two X, this is now plus two times X plus H, right? Because we plugged in X plus H where that X was. So this becomes now two times X plus H, all right? So again, I apologize. This should be plus two times X plus H in the top. Awesome. Any questions there? Does that uh, clear up some confusion? Awesome. Thanks for hanging with me. And then, cool. it, and then it's minus, and then it's minus what? And then it's minus this part. Okay, so uh, it's minus, it's minus this whole part right here. See that? This doesn't change. That stays the same up there. Do you see that? So this, so f of x plus h, f of x plus h is this entire expression. This is f of x plus h right here minus we're still keeping the uh, f of x equation up there, okay? So again, it's, I know it's super long and drawn out and complicated, all right? But this, everything that's in the uh, red right here, this is only f of x plus h, right? Everywhere there's an x in our f of x equation, we plug in x plus h, all right? That's how we get this term, that's how we get this term, boom. Now we subtract minus x squared minus two x, cool. Let me go ahead and rewrite this now. Oof, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and multiply this two in. So this is plus two X plus two H plus two H. Okay, I'm taking this all and I'm plugging this back into F of X plus H because that's what we just solved for. Okay, let me see if I can rewrite this a little bit cleaner. I'll just do it like this. Oh gosh, let's see if I can fit it. I don't know if I'll be able to. I'll try my best. Okay, this is now x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 2x plus, ooh, let me delete this, plus 2h all minus what's in the parentheses there. Cool. All right, let me go ahead and delete this. So that is a minus sign right there. Yes, I'll write it in black so it's a little bit more defined. Minus, oh, oh there's the eraser, cool. Minus all of that, okay? So everything that's in the red here, okay? Everything that's in the red, that is our F of X plus H, okay? That is our F of X plus H minus, our uh, f of x, right? That's what's in the blue all over h, okay? So you can see all I did was I plugged it into the formula. Cool, let's go ahead and see what cancels, all right? So I just wanted to show you that's what, that's what we just accomplished. If it doesn't make sense, go back, watch the YouTube recording. Hopefully you can like skip past my little mistake and it'll uh, make sense, cool. Let's talk about it. Let's see what cancels on the top. So this now becomes this minus sign right here, okay? This gets minus x squared minus 2x, right? Because we can treat it as it, we're subtracting the entire f of x function. So we multiply that minus sign on the inside. We now get minus x squared, right? Minus 2x. Minus 2x like that, right? Let's see what cancels. Boom. We have a positive. You know, let me delete that. All right. Now let's go ahead and reduce the entire top, all right? We have a x squared minus x squared x squared minus x squared, boom, those cancel. We have a plus two x, we have a minus two x, boom, those cancel. What do we have left on top? We have a, again, I'm uh, noticing that uh, I've made one more mistake here. What did I make? x plus h squared. Let me, let me factor this out really quick because I think I made a quick mistake you're like, wow, if he can't even do it right, how am I supposed to? Great question. X squared plus HX plus HX plus H squared. No, that seems right. So I'm missing, I'm missing a, no, 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 no. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, No, yeah. Um, plus 2H, not H squared. Actually, no, I have that. I have it. It's okay. correct. No, everything. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Thank you. I was, I was like, wait, no. Yeah, it's, it's correct. Cool. Forget everything that I just said. Completely erase it from your memory. Cool, let's go ahead and keep solving. Um, we now have, what is left on top? We have a 2HX, we have a 2HX plus H squared plus 2H. 
on the top, all divided by an H on the bottom. Guess what? We're factoring out this top. We'll factor out an H from the top. Let's go ahead and do it. All right. Let's pull on H. This is equivalent to H times. We have 2X plus H plus 2 on the top. All right. All divided by H on the bottom. Cool. H's cancel out. Boom. What are we left with? We are left with, don't forget, we're taking the limit as H approaches zero. Okay. The limit as H approaches zero of now this, right? Because we canceled out our H's. Oops. As H goes to zero, boom, that goes to zero. What are we left with? 2X plus two. 2X plus two. Does everyone see how we got exactly what we were looking for? 2X plus two right here, yes? Sorry, I know that was a very long, complicated process. I will try my best to not give you a very evil, precise definition of a derivative on your test tomorrow. I just under I just care that you can understand how to how to get the right answer by doing that process, right? Um, any questions here, or can I move on? It's ten oh four. I'd like to get into some derivatives. I do have a question. Uh, so, do you get a different answer from from using like the the simple one and the precise one? No. Remember, this is this is the simple answer up here. I said right before at the very beginning of the problem, I said I know the answer is two x plus two. Why? Because I used our basic, uh, I, I used our basic polynomial. Oh, okay, okay. You know, right? for the other, for the other. Yeah, yeah. And so we used the long, precise definition of a derivative, and we saw that two x plus two is the same thing that we said we stated at the very beginning. It's two x plus two. So yeah, it gives you the exact same answer. All right, cool. Yep. All right, cool. That's all I wanted to cover from here. It's ten oh five. Awesome. Let's do two more problems. These are going to be some good derivative problems. Uh, for the sake of time, I want to uh, jump all the way into like 3.3, 3.4, because 3.1 and 3.2, those are just your basic problems, all right? What's the derivative of x to the fourth, okay? Using our basic power rule, right, which we said that if we have x to the n, right, then f prime of x is equal to nx, nx to the n minus one power, okay, for polynomials. Cool. n is equal to four. This becomes four x cubed right four minus one is three awesome um that is simply just the power rule i'm now jumping into section like 3.3 3.4 because that way we can use some product and quotient rules with some sine and cosine stuff that we also derived yesterday yes we're going there i know there are there are a few of you that mentioned to me in the chat that you weren't able to come yesterday that's okay go ahead watch yesterday's lecture first and then come back to the youtube uh, video for today's le like lesson and then go ahead and try and figure out um like how i'm doing what i'm doing okay uh i'm in section 3.4 looking at their exercises let's go ahead and take the derivative of let's go ahead and do this one Hmm. Uh, if you are wondering what can I throw at you that's going to be one of those harder complex problems tomorrow, all right, expect something along the lines of this, all right. I want to take the derivative of sine of cosine of 2x. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, I've never done this before. Yes, you have. Well, sort of. <laughs> Again, remember our derivative rules, okay? I want to get this into a form that I've seen before. If you printed off that derivative, uh, the derivative list sheet that I uploaded onto B courses in the file section, perfect. You already know where I'm going with this. Okay. What is ddx of this equation? What is it? Right. What is the derivative of sine of cosine of two of x? In other words, this cosine of two of x, that is the operation of the sine. So the sine operation is taking the operation of that cosine of 2x. Okay. So the cosine of 2x is inside of the sine, not multiplied on the outside. So we are not using the product rule here. Okay. I want everyone to recognize that at first. Okay. What do we do now? We do know this. Okay. We know that the derivative of sine of u, okay, is equal to u prime cosine of u. That is our derivative. Okay. That is how we take the derivative of sine of u, where u could be anything. It could be a function. It could be a number. It could be a, a variable, right? So it's not in the generic form that we're used to seeing. 
But <clears throat> hopefully you wrote this down and you remember from yesterday, right? This is how we take the derivative of sine of u. Okay, how do we take the derivative of sine of u? Okay, well, in this case, what should I label as my u? So that way I get a sine of u problem. Does everyone see what I'm asking? In other words, this is our derivative rule here. I'm gonna box it. Sine of u is equal to u prime cosine of u. If I wanna turn this into the sine of u, okay, I should probably say u is equal to cosine of 2x. Does everyone see how I did that? Right? So if u equals cosine of 2x, all I do is plug it back in, right? It's as easy as that. Now, this becomes sine of u, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and leave that up here. I'm going to rewrite it as this down here. So uh, we said u equals cosine of 2x. All right? We said we said we plug in this u, right, right here. So now rewriting this, we literally get, uh, rewriting it down here, we get this is sine of u, okay? This is now the derivative with respect to u, okay? So I know it says ddx, but again, this is the same thing. This is saying this is now ddu of sine of u. Cool. Um, what do we know that's equal to? We know that that is equal to u prime cosine of u. All right, let's go ahead and write that out. Oh, wait, we just did. Awesome. So again, we rewrote it, sine of u. Okay, all we did was say u equals cosine of 2x, rewrote it down here, boom, sine of u. We already almost solved the problem, okay? The derivative of sine of u is equal to u prime cosine of u. Well, we labeled u equals cosine of 2x. Cool, let's go ahead and rewrite it. So the derivative is equal to u prime cosine of u. In this case, we said u is equal to cosine of 2x, right? u equals cosine of 2x right up here. Boom, I'm gonna write it in here just like this, cosine of 2x, like that, boom. All right, we're almost done with this problem. The only thing we are missing is u prime, right? So everyone see how the only thing we're missing is u prime? Okay, how do we find u prime? We take the derivative of u, okay? What is u? Oh, we labeled it right up here. We said u is equal to cosine of 2x. What is the derivative of cosine of 2x? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and now rewrite this, or I'm just gonna erase this, right? Because all we did was just plug things back in. Um, we said u is equal to cosine of 2x. What is u prime? Okay, I already know this is negative two times sine of 2x. All right, that's how I know because I've taken the derivative of cosine sine in any way, shape, or form for years, okay? So this is u prime. I've been doing this for years, so I automatically know it's u prime is equal to negative two sine of two x. What if uh, you're not familiar with seeing that two multiplied into the x? I'll go ahead and write that out as well, all right? So pretend it's its own separate problem for just a second, all right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and prove this to everybody. It's its own problem for right now, okay? We said uh, u is equal to cosine of two x. What is the derivative, all right? What is the derivative d dx of cosine of 2x, okay, all by itself. All right, well, you would tell me, well, I don't know exactly what the derivative of cosine of 2x, but I do know based off of the rule that you gave me yesterday that the derivative of cosine of u, okay, in this case, u represents a different function. Now, remember, treat the problem as if it's its own separate problem. So this u is now different than the other u that we're using to solve this problem, okay? Well, that is equal to negative u prime sine of u, okay? Okay, how do we get it into the form of cosine of u? Okay, we say u equals 2x, u prime equals two. Cool, plug in our values, plug in two, plug in 2x, okay? That's sine of u, sorry, let me, hopefully everyone sees how I got that, all right? So plugging in these values, you can see right away, it becomes negative two sine of two X. Is that what I have up here in this, in this black box? Yes, it is. All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll leave this here, all right? But you can see how I, I took it individually, right? And now I plugged it back in, cool. Now we have that our original U prime is equal to negative two times sine of two X. Are we done? Yes, we are. All we have left is to plug in this u prime. Let's go ahead and do it. U prime times cosine of u. In this case, we said u prime is equal to negative two sine of two x. Boom, problem solved. This is our final answer right here. 
All right. Um, I will go ahead and leave this up. That is the last thing that I wanted to show you uh, because for the most part, that is, well, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll do one more quick example. Um, one more quick example. So in this case, we didn't use the product or the quotient rule, right? We just used some straight up U substitution stuff with something that we're not familiar with as much. But you can see by just writing everything out, in the, I think that's the hardest part is, you know, A, recognizing how can I turn this into a form that I've seen before, right? I said, this is your derivative rule, use it. Sine of U equals U prime cosine of U, right? So the next step, what did we do? We said, all right, u equals cosine of 2x. Boom, wrote it right here. Okay, plug everything in that we know. All right, boom, plug in u. What do we have left over? We have a u prime, all right? So cosine of u, boom, that's easy. Now we just have to find u prime. Okay, how do we find u prime? All right, well, we said, oops. We said, oh, okay, the derivative of u, right? So u prime, that's simply the derivative of cosine of 2x. Okay, if you don't know how to take the derivative of cosine of 2x, turn it into something that you do know how to solve, right? So that's what we did in this step right here. What's the derivative of cosine of 2x? Well, I know that my formula, right? My formula for cosine of 2x is in this red box. Co the derivative of cosine of u, right? This u is separate from the other u of the different problem, right? Treat it individually. Uh, we said, all right, if u equals 2x, this now becomes a problem that is cosine of u, right? Now I can take the derivative of cosine of u. That's simply negative u prime sine of u. Awesome. I know what u is. I know what u prime is. Go ahead, plug it back in. All right, plug back in everything. Boom. Now I have this expression right here in this black box. Go ahead, take that u prime, plug it back in. Problem solved. I know it's a very complex process for people who have not seen who, who are, like if this is your first time seeing a calculus course i understand that this is very challenging this is this is standard berkeley level okay i'm going to make this one of your harder problems on the test so the, one of the last two problems just keep in mind this is pretty standard so you'll see problems that are even more complex than this on your midterms and your final it sucks that's just how berkeley is you know what i mean and so i'm trying to give i'm trying to prepare you the best that i can right so that way, uh, if you can study hard the next two weeks, understand how to do this problem, right? Go back to the YouTube channel, figure it out. If you can understand how to do this problem, you will be in really good position to get a really good grade, right? Awesome. So any questions there? Sorry, I just wanted to go through and explain everything. Could we use the chain rule instead? Um, can we use the chain rule instead or should we get better at u sub if given this problem on the midterm will it ask us directly to take the derivative using u substitution this is a great question um i see uh so the two standard problems will be trig functions for the most part i'll all right sorry i'm seeing the questions in the chat now um would i prefer you to use u sub or can you use the shortcut here's the thing okay here's the thing let's talk okay one quick second and then i'll do a very very easy product rule problem should you use the u sub? Should you use the method that you know how to do? Okay. The u sub is inherently the chain rule. Okay. That might not make much sense now, but essentially sine of 2x, okay, the form that I have taught you and the form that's on that sheet, that that incorporates the chain rule. In other words, okay, the derivative of sine of u, how I have it like this, is equal to u prime cosine of u. Okay. That that takes into account the chain rule already. That's why that's why I really, really like this form better because it's so much faster, right? So if I just gave you the derivative of sine of x, okay, you it's as simple as this. U equals x, u prime equals one. All right. You can see how this literally is just the cosine of x, right? You plug in u prime, u prime is just one. You plug in your u equals x. Boom, problem solved. This is one times the cosine of x. And that's how we get the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, right? So you can see how this is a very, very powerful, it's a very, very powerful equation in the sense that you don't even have to really remember the chain rule, okay? Because what happens What happens when you get your to your test, right? Your midterm test, your Math 1A final at Berkeley, okay? Two, two, three months down the line here, what happens when they give you a problem that's like, what's the derivative of sine of cosine of E to the uh, um, cosine of X, okay? I'm telling you, this is what you're going to see. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you, right? What happens when you have to take the derivative of this? You're going to be losing your mind because the chain rule in this problem becomes very, very complex. How do you solve this? It's as simple as this. Do what you know, 
I know that the derivative of sine of u is this. This is equal to u prime cosine of u, all right? Label your u. In this case, u is this whole mumbo jumbo thing, right? u equals cosine of e to the x, e to the x, or sorry, e to the cosine of x. Okay, how do I take the derivative of this thing? All right, turn it into a form that I know, right? Well, I know that the derivative of cosine is simply, right? Uh, or the derivative of cosine of u, uh, do you see how I'm doing this, right? So you just, you write it out, but I'm telling you, you will see a problem that is like this. So if you wanna use the chain rule, that's fine, okay? If you wanna use the chain rule, go for it. I'm not telling you what you can and can't do, right? There's, uh, all I'm telling you is when you get to something like this, I would much rather you remember this u sub formula and get good at it. So that way, when you see something like this on your test, you're not just like, oh, good Lord, how do I even start to solve this, right? That's all. Um, <laughs> tell you what, I will go ahead and solve this out uh, in office hours, or not office hours, I'll go ahead and solve this out on YouTube, so that way you can see exactly how to solve this, okay? Otherwise, um, one other thing, study the product rule. I know we haven't uh, discussed it. Tell you what, if you know how to take the uh, product rule of e to the x times sine of x, you're in good shape, okay? So if you can take the derivative of this, you're prepared for anything that I'm gonna throw at you tomorrow. Sorry, I know I went a little bit over time, but go ahead, study this tonight. Hopefully for the most part, all these problems were pretty straightforward and easy. I will go ahead and stop the recording now.